Wow, okay. You know what, let's just close in prayer. I don't, I don't know what we're gonna do now after that. Uh, the last time I was at Saddleback, I was 26 years old uh, preaching, and uh, this was a tent, and everything around it was dirt, right? Anybody here remember that? You guys remember that? Okay, yeah, quite a few of you. So this is like, this is like old home week. Well, we uh, are just delighted, Susan and I, to, to be here. We feel like uh, we're back home. And uh, Rick and I have been friends for so many years. He's been just so kind to us, and uh, thank you for just your, your warm welcome. It's a little overwhelming. Uh, but it's very appreciated. You know, uh, as we're kicking this series off, I was thinking about just how easy, easily Christmas seems to sneak up on us. Uh, I don't know if you're ready for it. I'm certainly not. But no doubt many of us over the next couple of weeks are going to be at Christmas parties and office parties and having dinner with family and friends and, uh, and colleagues celebrating the season. You know, Christmas is the time for trimming trees and, and, and stringing lights and drinking hot chocolate and setting up the nativity scene. It's time when we sing joy to the world and we pray for peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Christmas is supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year. And yet we know, because it's a well-documented fact, that people struggle more with discouragement and depression during the holidays than at, than at any other time of the year. One survey reported that 45% of all Americans dread the Christmas season because it's just another reminder of an absent loved one, a lost job, a painful divorce, or unrealized dreams as just one more year passes us by. So what can we do to get through these holiday blues? Well, that's what I wanna to talk to you about this morning. And I think you can sum the answer up in one word. It's the word hope. Hope is the essential ingredient for an abundant life, the kind of life that Jesus wants for us. And it's essential. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 12, there on your outline, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. We need hope. Dr. Viktor Frankl was in the uh, Auschwitz prison camp during World War II. And as a psychiatrist, he was interested in what it was that enabled some people to survive the rigors of the camp and the cruelty while others did not. And he wrote down his findings in a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Listen to what he says about the power of hope. The prisoner who had lost faith in the future, his future was doomed. With his loss of belief in the future, he also lost his spiritual hold. He let himself decline and became subject to mental and physical decay. Hope is a powerful force in the human heart, but it can dissipate so quickly, especially during, during the Christmas season. But, no pun intended, there is, there is hope. And I'm not talking about a, a feeling of optimism where you're kind of trying to pump yourself up about the future. Because for some of you, things aren't okay right now. And so to, to, to try to make it any different than the reality that it is feels disingenuous. But I believe that true and lasting hope is available to everyone and is the result of a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was so much more than a baby born 2,000 years ago to a, a poor family on the outskirts of nowhere. There's something very different about the Christ child. And when you discover those differences, you'll be surprised by hope. 700 years before Jesus was born, a prophet declared the qualities of a coming savior. Look at what he said in Isaiah 9, 6, there on your outline. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. These four qualities describe the, the coming Savior who we know to be none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus was the child who was born 2,000 years ago. Jesus was the son that was given. And when you put your faith in him, believing these qualities, you'll be surprised by hope. 
So let's take a look at them. The first quality that Isaiah used to describe the coming Savior is wonderful counselor. And Jesus, as my counselor, reveals God's love for me. I want you to write that down. He reveals God's love for me and for you. Now, Jesus has no need for counselors or advisors. Being God, he's omniscient. In fact, uh, the Bible says that in him is, all, is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So we know that whatever Jesus says is, is true. Now, that phrase, wonderful counselor, could literally be translated wonder of a counselor. And the Hebrew word there for wonder often refers to the impact that is created by a supernatural act of God. And there may be no greater supernatural act of God than when he sent his son 2,000 years ago to be born as a human being, to live the perfect life as only he could live, and then to go pay the price for sin by dying on the cross. The greatest act of love ever demonstrated. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, there on your outline, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came as the embodiment of God's unconditional love, and he died on the cross to pay the price for your sin and mine and everyone who puts their faith in him. John 3.16 from the Amplified Bible says, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten unique son. So that whoever believes in, trusts and clings to, relies on him shall not perish, shall not come to destruction or be lost, but have eternal or everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge, reject, condemn, or to pass sentence on the world, but that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through him. But Jesus didn't just die so that you and I could get to heaven. Jesus died so that we can get to God. Do you realize do you realize that the God of the universe wants to be with you? You know, last week, Pastor Rick was talking about how to be a friend of God, and he stressed the fact that God wants to be with you, that God loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son to pay the price for your sin and for mine at the cross. I, I was trying to think of a way that I could visualize the enormity of God's love. And so uh, this is kind of what I came up with. God's love for you is so enormous and more amazing than the largest stars or planets in our universe. All right, so go with me on this for a second, okay? This is a, this is a picture of the, uh, the planets in our solar system. And just as a comparison, look at, look at the size of the Earth compared to, say, Jupiter. I mean, it, it's a pretty significant difference. The next picture, now look at the size of Jupiter in comparison to our sun pretty dramatic. In fact, comparatively, and then look at the Earth. The Earth just looks like a little dot. Comparatively, you can take a hundred planets the size of the Earth and string them across the sun. That's how massive the sun is. It's almost incomprehensible, isn't it? Or, or you can look at it this way. You can fit 960,000 planets the size of the Earth into our sun. I mean, it, it's just, it's almost incomprehensible. But, but it gets better. It's like a Ginsu knife commercial, okay? So, um, so now look at the size of the sun compared to uh, the size of the star Arcturus. Look at our sun in comparison to, to Arcturus. It's unbelievable. And then this, this next slide, you could fit 17,500 of our suns into Arcturus. That's how massive Arcturus is. But it gets better than that. Look at Arcturus there, it's third, uh, third from, the, uh, from the right, in comparison to Antares. It, it, it's mind-blowing. I mean, who knew, right? So I took a shot. I'm not an artist, but I took a shot at drawing what I, would, uh, what I think it would look like for a human being to be compared to the immensity of God's love, and this is what I came up with. God loves you more than the largest star or the largest planet 
His love for you is more vast than the 225 billion galaxies. I mean, his love is so vast, it's almost incomprehensible, humanly speaking. When my girls were little, uh, one of the ways that I would show that I love them is I would say, love you, the whole universe. Love you, Jesse. Love you, Ari. Whole universe. And as they were growing up, they'd say, love you, Daddy. Whole universe. Now they're 27 and 24. Love you, Daddy. Give me the credit card. <laughs> so some things have changed. God loves you, the whole universe, and beyond. So when you, when you believe in the enormity of God's love for you and the intensity of his wanting to be with you, to be, to be your friend, you'll be surprised by hope. The second quality Isaiah uses to describe the coming Savior is mighty God. Jesus, as the mighty God, is in control. Write that down. In control of all things. One of the attributes of God that is most comforting to me is his sovereignty. Just knowing that nothing happens in my life that is outside of his, his knowing or outside of his control. And that the good, the bad, and the ugly things that happen in my life, he's aware of. And he's working behind the scenes. Now, don't misunderstand me. Jesus doesn't cause the bad and ugly things in life, but he allows them in order to grow our faith and mature our character more and more into the image of Christ. And remember, there can be no transformation without tribulation. The Bible says in James 1, 2, and 4 in the Message Translation, consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so that you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Peter alludes to the same idea in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. He says, there is wonderful joy ahead. Now, you've got to understand who Peter's talking to here. He's talking to Christians that were under the persecution of Nero, some of the most sadistic, intense, cruel persecution that Christians have, have ever experienced. And, and Peter almost has the audacity to say that there's, there's hope, but it's coming. It's not here right now, but it's coming. So, so live your life with one eye on eternity. That's what he's saying. There's wonderful joy ahead. Even though now you have to endure many trials for a little while, these trials, he says, will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many, I want you to circle that, through many, not a few, but many, Many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Christ Jesus is revealed to the whole world. Friends, don't forget that God accomplishes his purposes through my problems. That he has a reason. That he's working. That he's in control. So no matter what is happening in your life, you can be confident that Jesus as the mighty God is in complete control. He has all authority and all power and is quite literally holding your life together. Think of it like this. This is a picture of an atom. Now, the atom is made up of subatomic particles called protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, we're gonna have a little science, science review here. The protons and uh, neutrons form the center or the nucleus of the atom and the electrons kinda float above it in a, in a small cloud. I also want you to notice that the protons have a positive charge while the neutrons have no charge, so they're, they're neutral. And physicists have discovered that, that two positive charges put together, will, they, won't, they won't clasp together, but they, they resist each other, okay? Uh, it's like when, you were, when we were kids, remember we'd take magnets, and we'd take a, a magnet and we'd kind of turn the polarity and we'd try to push them together and you just, you know, you just can't do it. They're just, they're resisting each other. That's what should happen in the nucleus of an atom. But instead, going back to the picture, you'll notice that the protons and the neutrons are clinging together. It's like taking the magnet and reversing the polarities and putting it together, they stick. 
That is scientifically impossible. And the scientists cannot figure out why the protons and the neutrons stick together. Remember, protons have the, the, the positive charge, neutrons have no charge. And they can't explain it. Dr. Carl Darrow is a, a highly respected physicist at the Bell Laboratories in New Jersey. And listen to what he says. All the massive nuclei have no right to be alive at all. Indeed, they should never have been created, and if created, they should have blown up instantly. So we should, have, we should be having nuclear explosions all over the place because everything in life is made up of matter, therefore it's composed of atoms. But he says they're still all here. He says some inflexible inhibition is holding them relentlessly together. The nature of the inhibition is also secret, one thus far reserved by nature for herself. Now, Dr. Darrow's mistake is that the nature of this inhibition is not a what, it's a who. The Bible tells us in Colossians 1.17 that is, it is in him, referring to Jesus, that holds all things together. Th those words there, hold together, mean to cohere or to be constituted with. In other words, the, according to the Bible, Jesus is literally holding everything together. John MacArthur, in his commentary on Colossians, he says this. He said, not only did Jesus create the universe, he also sustains it. He maintains the delicate balance necessary to life's existence. He quite literally holds all things together. He is the power behind every consistency in the universe. Dr. Douglas Moo, in his commentary on Colossians, says what holds the universe together is not an idea or a virtue, but a person, the resurrected Christ. Without him, electrons would not continue to circle nuclei. Gravity would cease to work, and the planets would not stay in their orbits. Now, do you really think that if Jesus can hold the entire universe together on a subatomic level, that your problems are too difficult for him? There is nothing that can happen in your life that is outside the power of Jesus. Uh, me and my family are going through a really difficult uh, season right now. And Susan and I were down at the beach the other night and we were watching the sunset and I was sitting on a rock and you know, God's showing off. He's painting this amazing sunset for us. And, and I sat there and I said, you know, honey, if God can do that, he can take care of us. And God can take care of you. There's nothing that happens in your life. But you see what we, what we tend to do is we tend to go, okay, Jesus, you can have these things, but this really big one, I'm just gonna hold on to that one. I don't think you can handle that one. How's that working for you? He just wants you to put them all at his feet, to just trust in who he is, in his character, that he's loving, in his nature, that he is God. He's got your back. That's why the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7 to cast some of your anxiety on him. Is that what it says? Cast all. Every bit of it you can cast upon him. Why? Because he cares. You know, so many times when the bottom falls out of life or when reality kicks down the door, we think that God is mad at us. We think that God is punishing us. You know, we're, we're just confused and we want, we want to, to know why. Listen, you could be given a dissertation on the why, but it doesn't change how you're feeling. But God is there. He's there in the moment. He's there in the feelings. And he's taking care of you. Will you let him or will you resist him? See, when you believe that Jesus' love for you is greater than the largest stars of the planets in the universe, and as the mighty God, he has everything under control, that he's working behind the scenes, doing things you have no idea he's doing, then you'll be surprised by hope. The third quality Isaiah used to describe the coming Savior is everlasting Father. Jesus, as the everlasting Father, keeps his promises. I want you to write that down. He keeps his promises. 
This is a, a picture of uh, me and my family back in uh, 1983. Uh, again, those are my two girls. Susan doesn't look any different today. Me, on the other hand, well, you know. I, I'd get arrested if I had a mustache like that today, I think. <laughs> But when my girls were little, when they were, when they were that age, they had an endless list of wants. You know, Daddy, can I have this? Daddy, I want that. You know, you take them to the store and you go at the checkout stand and it's just grab, grab, grab. What I want, what I want. You know, Daddy, can I have this? And most of the time I'd have to say no. But on the rare occasion, when I would say yes, they'd always ask me the same question. And if you're a parent, you know what the question is. Do you promise? <laughs> do you promise, Daddy? Do you, do you mean it, Daddy? Can I really have it, Daddy? And I tried to be very careful about the promises that I made to my girls because I never wanted to break a promise. Because I wanted my girls to, to grow up knowing that, that I'm dependable, that they can trust their daddy. That when he makes a promise, it's as good as done as far as it is in his ability to do. Now, there were some times, of course, when I wouldn't make a promise and I'd say something like, well, we'll see, or, or, or maybe, or... But... Those are okay because those, those aren't statements that are binding. But a promise, well, a promise is a promise. And broken promises break little hearts. And no father wants to do that to his children. And Jesus, as God the Son, has all the divine attributes of our Heavenly Father. Hebrews 1.3 from the Amplified Bible says that he, referring to Jesus, is the perfect imprint and very image of God. Therefore, Jesus has the same heart for us as the Father. And as the living word, he always keeps his promises. So when the Bible says that God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble, you can believe it. When the Bible says that the Lord God is a sun and a shield, the Lord gives grace and glory, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly, you can believe it. When the Bible says that the righteous man will flourish like a palm tree, he will grow like a cedar in Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. You can believe it. When God says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look around you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And when you believe that Jesus' love for you is greater than the largest stars or planets in our universe, that he as the mighty God has everything in your life under control. And as the everlasting father, he always keeps his promises. You'll be surprised by hope. The fourth quality that Isaiah used to describe the coming savior is the prince of peace. Jesus, as the Prince of Peace, has made peace between God and me. He has made peace between us. When, I, when Isaiah refers to the Savior as the Prince of Peace, he's referring specifically to the fact that Jesus has made peace between you and God. <clears throat> you see, before, before a person uh, trusts Christ with their life, they, as a sinner, are separated from a holy and righteous God. And so there's a barrier between us. And there is a price that needed to be paid for that sin to be forgiven. Because God is righteous. For, for, God, to just, for God to just say uh, about our sin, well, I know, I know you didn't mean it. And, you know, boys will be boys and girls will be girls. So if you promise not to do it again, it'll be okay. He can't do that. Because he would be violating his, the, his nature as a holy and righteous God. So God has to punish sin. That's the bad news. The good news is that Jesus took that punishment on himself at the cross. See, before Christ, all we can expect to receive from the Father is his wrath. But Jesus took upon himself all the wrath of God for your sin and for mine. The Father poured out the entire cup of his wrath upon his Son. And you know what that means? That means there's no wrath left for those who put their faith in Christ. You never have to worry about the wrath of God because Jesus took all of his wrath 
upon himself. He shed his blood to pay the penalty that we deserve. He took our place under the wrath of God. So once you put your faith in Jesus as your savior, trusting in his sacrifice as the payment for your sin, you are reconciled with God. So God's no longer angry with you because of your sin. Jesus has literally made peace between you and the Father. Look what the Bible says in Colossians 1, 19 to 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, referring to Jesus, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Don Richardson was a missionary to a tribe named called the Sawi in Irian Jaya, Indonesia. And the Sawi were a ruthless people, constantly at war with the neighboring villages. And being that they valued treachery and, uh, and deceit and murder, Richardson just thought there was no hope to win these people to Christ and get to a place where they were at peace with other people. However, there was a custom that was legendary with the Sawi called the peace child. This child was uh, the child, uh, uh, the baby in one village that was given to another village. And as long as that child was alive, there would be peace between those two villages. And so Don Richardson used this custom as an analogy for the reconciling work of Christ. And he told them that Jesus Christ was God's peace child to all men. And because Christ lives eternally through him, there would always be peace between God and those who put their faith in his son. And as a result, many of the Sawi came to know Christ as their savior, and a, and a large evangelical church flourished. Jesus, as the Prince of Peace, has made peace between you and the Father. And when you believe that, you'll be surprised by hope. So where are you at today? Which of these four qualities did did you need to hear or be reminded of? Did you need to be reminded of God's immense love for you that is greater than the largest stars or planets in the universe? Or that Jesus as the mighty God has all your problems under control? That there's never a time where something happens and God goes, oh, sorry, I missed that, I fell asleep. That's never gonna happen. Maybe you resonated with the fact that, that Jesus as the everlasting Father always keeps the promises that he makes to you through his word. Or maybe there's some of you here that have finally connected the dots and you realize that as a sinner, I'm separated from a holy and righteous God, but, but he wants to fix that. And I understand now that, that Jesus wants to be the peace child for me. And if that's true of you, I just wanna give you the opportunity just to, to put your trust and your faith in Jesus for your salvation, for, for a new life, because you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And when you give your life to him, there's no condemnation for anyone who's in Christ Jesus. So would you bow your head with me? If you were to say, you know, Ken, um, I, I get it. I don't understand everything, but I get now that I need a savior. I'm a sinner, I, I need a savior. I've messed up my life. I've tried to do things and fix things that have just made things worse. I get it now. I wanna invite you to just pray this prayer after me. This is just between you and the Lord, so just in your heart with him. Just say something like this, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died to pay the price for my sin. And I am a sinner who needs a savior. Will you forgive me of my sin? Would you come into my life? And would you enable me from this point forward to follow you and to serve you? I pray these things in your name, amen.